In the world of shared office spaces, WeWork soared to the clouds, riding a wave of combined innovation and collaboration that catapulted it into its place at the cutting edge of modern business. But what goes up, as they say, must come down. Despite the lofty dreams, billion dollar valuations, and status as the leading name in the office space industry, an ongoing saga proves not every desk is destined to be a success story. This is the chronicle of WeWork, where the champagne flowed, but so did the red ink. How did this key innovator of the workplace go from being the biggest office space tenant in New York, with space in 32 countries and a valuation that matched the worth of a small country, to filing for bankruptcy after a turbulent period that came to a head earlier this year? Join us as we explore the rise and fall of WeWork and try to separate the dramatization from the reality. To understand what happened, we first need to look at what WeWork is and what it stands for. WeWork was founded in 2010 by Adam Newman and Miguel McKelvey, and later joined by Rebecca Newman, Adam's wife. The company originated with the idea of providing shared workspaces that fostered collaboration and community among freelancers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. The founders wanted to create a flexible and dynamic environment where people could work and interact, breaking away from the traditional and often rigid office space model. As it happened, what they envisioned was exactly what those groups of workers actually wanted, somewhere that reflected a proper, large, collaborative workplace, without needing to fill it themselves. McKelvey and the Newmans had identified a shift in the way people worked, with more individuals and companies embracing flexibility and seeking alternatives to long-term leases and traditional office setups. WeWork aimed to capitalize on this trend by offering a range of office spaces, from individual desks to private offices, with shared amenities such as meeting rooms, lounges, and communal spaces. WeWork's model allowed companies to rent office spaces on a flexible month-to-month -month basis. This appealed to startups, freelancers, and established businesses alike, as it provided them with the flexibility to scale up or down as needed. This was built upon by building a sense of community among its members, hosting networking events, workshops, and social gatherings to encourage collaboration and connections among the diverse set of professionals using the WeWork spaces, allowing people to learn from one another and truly collaborate, even if they worked alone as a freelancer. The appeal was not just on an intellectual level either. WeWork spaces became known for their modern, aesthetically pleasing designs, the company invested in creating vibrant, comfortable, and trendy environments that contrasted with more traditional office settings, which can be grey and boring. Due to this early success, WeWork embarked on a rapid global expansion, opening co-working spaces in major cities around the world. This aggressive growth strategy contributed to the company's high valuation and widespread recognition. In 2019, just nine years since its inception, WeWork's valuation had reportedly soared to $47 billion, making it one of the most valuable startups in the world at the time. So, how did such a highly valued, much talked about business go from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows in just three years? That lofty valuation is actually where the issues began for WeWork. Back in 2017, they'd raised the funds of about $20 billion. When they raised funds again two years later, and the valuation had more than doubled to $47 billion, people started asking questions. As WeWork prepared for its initial public offering, IPO, in 2019, concerns emerged about the company's financial health, governance structure, and the leadership style of its co-founder and CEO, Adam Newman. WeWork's attempt to go public faced challenges, and the company eventually abandoned its IPO plans in September 2019. When a business is scrutinized in this way, in the public eye, the effects can be catastrophic. As you might expect, WeWork's valuation began to decline rapidly. SoftBank, led by the enigmatic CEO Massa Sun, is renowned for its strategic investments in areas of perceived potential. Despite lingering concerns about their famous CEO's financial approach, SoftBank, which was already a pivotal investor in WeWork, stepped in to aid restructuring efforts and provide a crucial financial boost to stabilize the company. It may have seemed like a potential disaster had been avoided, or at the very least a knockout blow softened to a simple setback. However, this was just the beginning of the trouble at WeWork, and a new chapter of turbulence was about to begin. Those IPO findings revealed that WeWork had made a loss of almost $2 billion in 2018, which made the valuation filed in 2019 look extremely inflated. 
The valuation continued to fall, despite SoftBank doing everything possible to steady the ship. In September 2019, the business committed to focusing on the core elements of their operation, but it was at this moment that Adam Newman decided to jump ship. One of the founders of WeWork, who'd become the corporate face of the business standing down, was a sign of the inevitable. By October 2019, the valuation of the company was at just $8 billion. That was the lowest the business had been since 2015, and a fraction of the $48 billion valuation just 10 months before. In that same month, SoftBank Group secured an 80% acquisition of the company, injecting an additional $5 billion in funding. Just a month later, WeWork underwent a significant period of downsizing, parting ways with 2,400 employees, which constituted nearly one-fifth of its workforce to streamline the business and safeguard it for the future. In 2020, real estate veteran Sandeep Mathrani assumed the role of CEO, entrusted with a single mission – to revitalize the company. His mandate was to streamline the company's recurring expenses and implement a strategic restructuring of its debt to stabilize. The COVID-19 pandemic hit many businesses hard, but it's hard to argue that it could not have hit at a less opportune moment for rework. Even without the business in the freefall, half of the planet entering into a lockdown that lasted months could mark the end for any office space owner or manager. For WeWork, at the exact moment that things needed to get back on track, COVID put a halt on their operation with reduced demand for office spaces. This trend has only continued post-pandemic. In 2021, WeWork made its public debut through an SPAC merger, aiming to rebuild investor confidence. The listing mirrored a revamped strategy centered on prioritizing key markets, optimizing costs, and shifting towards serving larger corporate clients with hybrid work environments. At first, it seemed this had the desired effect, with the valuation stabilizing at around $9 billion. However, not long after the company went public, everything began to go wrong again. In two years, the value of the company had declined more than 98%, now worth under half a billion dollars. On November 6, 2023, a Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection filing was made for WeWork. The game was up. How did things go so wrong? There were definitely some external factors that led to the downfall of WeWork but the economic doubts that set the company on its downward spiral in 2019 originated from within. Adam Newman quit in 2019, but it wasn't simply due to the financial performance. There was an element of disgrace to his exit too. The valuation plummet was simply the reason the board needed to show him the door. Newman had faced criticism for his involvement in various business dealings that posed potential conflicts of interest. These included leasing properties he owned back to WeWork and receiving significant loans from the company. These transactions raised concerns about the transparency of WeWork's financial dealings. WeWork's corporate governance structure under Newman also raised eyebrows, particularly the concentration of power in his own hands. The structure included a three-class share system, giving Newman outsized control over the company. Investors and corporate governance experts had begun to express concerns about the lack of traditional checks and balances in place. Reports also emerged about WeWork's extravagant spending under Newman's leadership, this included details about the company's costly office leases, lavish company events, and questionable expenses. Critics argued that the spending habits were not aligned with the financial discipline expected from a company preparing for an IPO. Newman even had a private jet which the company sold after his departure in 2019. Newman also covered up losses, using valuations based on optimistic financial performance, to secure funding from investors like SoftBank. In the end, the move to file for public listing revealed these unstable foundations, which started the long fall from grace for the company. There are question marks on whether Newman should have pursued the public listing at all, in the knowledge that the business wasn't as viable as the valuation suggested. And then, the decision to pull out of his filing after the alarm bells had started to ring led to huge question marks around his leadership. It's easy to see why Newman was shown the exit door. Massa's son himself has admitted he was wrong to sanction the SoftBank investment to WeWork. There are so many facets to this story that you'd be fooled for thinking it was the plot of a TV drama and not real life. Apple TV Plus certainly thought so. In March 2022, the show We Crashed was released on the platform. This dramatization focused on the relationship between Adam and Rebecca Newman, played by Jared Leto and Anne Hathaway, respectively and how the couple navigated the epic rise of WeWork, right through until the company began to collapse as the financial misdealings came to light in 2019. The story had been highlighted in podcast form, which is what inspired the executives to have the show made. 
but We Crashed brought this story back to the public eye, several years after it made the business news. COVID masked many of these self-inflicted wounds to WeWork, and the show on one of the most watched streaming platforms in the world brought everything back to the fore. While the dramatization was successful and based on historical events, there was of course some liberty taken with the timeline of events and how they played out. For instance, one episode evolves Rebecca stirring controversy by making an onstage comment during the 2014 summer camp event, sparking discontent among female employees. However, it's essential to clarify that the actual incident occurred at the 2018 summer camp, and contrary to the portrayed aftermath, there was no subsequent discussion session, despite similar sentiments being publicly or privately expressed by female employees at various times. What the show does well is lift the lid on what life was like within WeWork with Adam Newman at the helm, with Rebecca in tow. The level of drama and controversy reveals why WeWork was destined to fail in the end. It's hard to imagine a business valued so highly, up there as one of the world's most profitable and investor-friendly startups, to fall so far from the heights it was hitting in 2018. Yet, here we are. In 2023, the business continues to operate, but has filed for bankruptcy protection, and will now need to undergo a period of intense change and restructuring as it looks forward to an uncertain future. Behind the failures, controversy, and charade, a valuation built on optimism under the leadership of someone who was seemingly unequipped to lead. The idea, one of collaboration between small businesses and freelancers and a shared workspace, to combat loneliness and make having a scalable base affordable was a sound one. Newman and McKelvey had the idea, but time would tell us all that Newman wouldn't be able to take that idea and turn it into a profitable business, even if he did a good job of making it look like a success. Have you ever used a WeWork space? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe and turn notifications on so you don't miss our next video. See you in the next one.